let's take our Bibles and look once again to the prophet Zechariah as we continue our reading commentary through his prophecy, which the Lord gave him. And we're going to be looking together at Zechariah chapter 4. These are short chapters, and yet so full of truth concerning Christ, drawn out of the history of Israel, particularly Zechariah, was one of the prophets that prophesied to those remnants, the remnant that came back from Babylon. In fact, Zechariah himself was likely born in captivity. And then when Darius gave the decree that Israel should go back and rebuild the city and the temple, Zechariah would have returned among those exiles. So this gives you a little background here. And his role, right along with Haggai, he was contemporary with Haggai, would have been to motivate, challenge the people to stay with the rebuilding of the temple. When they got back, they kind of drug their feet. In fact, it took over 20 years for that temple to be rebuilt because they were more concerned about building their own houses and getting themselves comfortable. But the Lord used Zechariah in these prophecies to show the importance of the rebuilding of the temple. It wasn't just rebuilding the temple, but what it signified, and that was a type of Christ, how worship was to be done in coming before God. So Zechariah chapter 4, and there's a, there are a lot of figures in here, symbolism, much like you find in the book of Revelation, but they're all significant as types and pictures of how God reveals his son. So here in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, we have a vision of olive trees and lampstands. It says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick of all of gold, and a with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and the seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. It's like a candelabra. You've seen a picture of it. One base and gold, and then seven stems. And that was used to light the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle and the temple. And so that's what he sees here, a vision of this. And then it says, verse 3, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. We know in the temple there wasn't any olive tree growing, so this is clearly symbolism that we need to ask the Lord to help us understand. So you can imagine there in verse 1, he waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Have you ever been wakened out of a dead sleep? What this shows is this wasn't a dream. This was the Lord that was suddenly waking him up. He was sleeping comfortably. And that's where he was given this vision of the lampstand of solid gold. We know in the temple, the lampstand is a picture of Christ. Solid gold has to do with his deity. He's the light of his temple, his people, his church, and he's the light of the world. But here specifically, it has to do with his church. So God gave Zechariah this vision of the golden lampstand. And since Zechariah and his people were to rebuild the temple, 
it made sense that God would speak to him then of the images of the things that would belong to that temple. It speaks here of seven pipes, the seven lamps, and then two olive trees in addition to the lampstand. Zechariah is seeing here what was never seen in any previous tabernacle or temple, that the two olive trees were actually supplying the seven lamps with oil through seven pipes. The priestly duties were to carry in olive oil on a regular basis. You can imagine what it would have been to keep that lamp stand in the temple going so that it never would go out. The priests were constantly going in and out and making sure that there was adequate supply. But here, the vision is of two olive trees and the lampstand self-filling without any man having to put his hand to it to keep it going. So what was this all about? And you can see, remember I said keep reading. Don't try to figure it out before you get to the end. Here, Zechariah asks in verse 4, So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Now that word angel, we've seen already before, means messenger, and Christ is referred to as a messenger of the covenant, and here he addresses him as his Lord. Angels aren't to be worshipped, and so every indication here is that it's the Lord himself appearing unto Zechariah. Then, verse 5, the angel or the messenger that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. So he's being very transparent. He's curious about it all. And he's waiting for an answer. He doesn't even try to give an answer. I think we get ourselves in trouble when we think we know the answer. Oh, I got it, I got it. I will tell you from my own experience that our first thoughts about Scripture interpretation are typically wrong. You read it, what comes to mind pops in your mind. You kind of think you know. And so you go down that trail and then the Lord has to bring you back because then you begin to compare Scripture with Scripture and you realize there's something more here. And I am thankful that we have this example here even with Zechariah. I think we presume that these prophets and even the apostles were more saintly and had more perception. and They depended on the same spirit of the Lord to teach them as we do. So here we are with this same word. This prophecy here would, would have been given almost 2,500 years ago. Stop and think about it. This is about 500 some years before. And here we are in 2000. And uh, it's been preserved for our learning and our understanding. So verses 6 and 7 now we get the meaning of the vision. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. That should be a capital S. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone Thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. So this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Remember that Zerubbabel was a civic leader in Jerusalem that the Lord had raised up and appointed to finish the work of the rebuilding of the temple. <clears throat> That's why it's known as Zerubbabel's temple. Solomon's was destroyed. The second temple was Zerubbabel's. And the second temple was not as big as Solomon's. In fact, some of those that had seen Solomon's temple, they were weeping. Remember, we saw that and bemoaning the fact that this second temple wasn't as big. Well, God purposed that this should diminish. The focus was not to be 
on the grandeur of the temple. In fact, when Christ came and was visiting the temple with the disciples, they were in awe because Herod purposed to try to add to the temple himself. And the Lord said, the day is coming when not one stone will remain upon another. And in 70 AD, that temple was destroyed. But you talk about the size, even of the particular stones that were placed there. You can look this up on your computer. Just look up the Temple Mount where the ruins are today. Those are huge stones. And where the wall, when Nehemiah finished building the wall, that wall is extensive, huge stones. And yet it was to all be temporary and to seed to Christ when he should come because that's who this is all about. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And the work had stalled. Like I said, it, people were more concerned about their own livelihoods than they were the rebuilding of the temple. But here was Zerubbabel thinking about the, the weight of what this was to rebuild this temple. And so this is where the Lord knowing his own thoughts, even though it's not expressed here. The Lord knows our thoughts. He knows our weaknesses. And I believe this word that he gives is particularly for Zerubbabel, to strengthen him. Just like when Joshua was to take the people in the land, the Lord met him and encouraged him to have strength. Here it says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Again, the Spirit was at work here in the Old Testament, but what's the Spirit's work to do? Point sinners to Christ. Why was it essential that Zerubbabel be strengthened to do this work? Well, it's because the temple would be a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word Spirit there can be translated just breath, the breath of God. But we know that the Spirit of God is the very being of God. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So here God purposed that Zerubbabel would know that it was the Holy Spirit who would continually supply his need and strengthen him, just as the olive trees in the vision were to continually supply oil to the lamps on the lampstand. Therefore God cares for, takes care of his work. This is a reminder that this wasn't Zerubbabel's to do in his own strength, but this was the Lord directing him. And when it says there that he would bring forth the headstone, verse 7, that's a capstone that whenever a building is finished, it's put on at the top to cap it off and... Uh, Therein we see that this was a work that although Zerubbabel would begin it and would finish it, yet it was the Lord giving a type and picture of the work of Christ, that the capstone of Christ's work was at the cross. He came and earned and established a righteousness. He laid the foundation in his life but the capstone was his death. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And that's why it says grace, grace unto it. It would be through the work, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of that's a type. And then in verses 8 through 10, more encouragement for Zerubbabel. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. You see how he's the type of Christ? That Christ came and laid the foundation and he finished it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. In other words, the seven 
candlesticks or the, the seven uh, pipes on the candlestick. Notice here it gives the answer. What, what does it represent? They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. So Zerubbabel is a type of Christ who has despised the day of small things. People were complaining this temple isn't as big as the old one. Doesn't matter. God's still at work. I dare say we should not despise the day of small things. Sometimes you can look around and think, where are those that in our day truly have been taught of the Lord? A lot of religion. And here we are meeting in small numbers, and sometimes it can get discouraging, but don't despise the day of small things. Because where the Lord's at work, many times he takes small things and turns them into big things, just like the lad with the five loaves and two fishes. What, what is that with so many? The disciples asked the Lord that. And he said, just take it and start distributing it to the people. And when they'd finished, there were 12 baskets left over, more than what could ever have been imagined or thought of. So I find encouragement in that. We don't know how the Lord's going to bless, but everything's exactly the way he's purposed it. And these seven, it says here, rejoice to see the plumb line. That's what the plummet is. You know, it's for they shall rejoice in verse 10 and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. So it's figuratively speaking, symbolic, as if together all of this is to the glory and honor of God himself. They rejoice when they see Zerubbabel busy with the building work, with the plumb line in his hand. That's a picture of Christ who came to accomplish the work. And for us, when we go back and read in the Gospels, we rejoice to see the Lord busy about building his church. He said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the seven lamps that represent the eyes of the Lord. The Lord knows the beginning from the end because he's purposed the end from the beginning. And uh, so they're happy to see God motivating and moving in the building of his temple. The work to be in, empowered by the spirit of God. And the plumb line, everything being a drought, that means that it had to be in accord with God's righteousness. That's what Christ came to do, to earn and establish that righteousness, that God would be just to justify that people for whom he laid down his life. And then verses 11 through 14, a clear explanation again of the olive trees and the lampstands. Zechariah is curious. He's, he's not going to get away without knowing more about this. Isn't that the way it is when we read the scriptures? You read some scripture and then you begin to look over here and see how that applies and you come over here and read. Pretty soon time has gone by. You haven't realized how much has. Here in verse 11, then answered I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches which through the Two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. I'm here to be taught. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. These are the two anointed ones. And boy, all kinds of speculation as to who that may be, but in the context so far, remember last time, who did we see the Lord had raised up? A priest in the name of Joshua, that was in chapter 3, and now Zerubbabel in chapter 4. So in that context, he's telling Zechariah, these are the two anointed ones, because the Lord says, let every truth be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So the two witnesses unto the Lord in this day were Joshua and Zerubbabel. And 
the two olive branches from the trees, they represent the, well, Zerubbabel would represent the kingly office of Christ and Joshua the priestly office of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's all typical of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that he should come and accomplish. He is the, these two anointed ones represent Christ, the anointed one. And from him flows into these uh, lamps, these seven lamps, the oil, that's the spirit working through these, even as the Lord Jesus Christ never did anything apart from the spirit. And so these two anointed ones were given this work to do. Joshua, the high priest, Zerubbabel, the representing the, the civic leader, the king, and together by, not by their own strength, but by the spirit of God, there would be a continual flow and supply into these lamps to the glory and honor of Christ. So that's what this chapter is about. You know, the Lord often works in twos. He sent his disciples out two by two. When he raised up Moses, who did he give him? Aaron. When he raised up Joshua, who did he have? Caleb. When he raised up Elijah, who else was there? Elisha. Where there was Peter, there was John. And where there was Paul, there was a Barnabas. This is often how the Lord works in uh, carrying on his work of the ministry of, of Christ. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word, how profound it is, and how dull we are. We read so many times these portions without understanding, but I pray that you would make us like Zechariah. Wherever we don't, that we would pause and seek your face and ask that you be our teacher and that we see throughout Scripture how all of it points to the glory and honor that you've purposed should be to your Son alone. So we give you the thanks for what we've read so far. Pray for your blessing as we continue our time of worship together. And we ask this in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.